Thank you very much, Premier Cartwright Robinson, for taking the time to, to meet with us. Being a British overseas territory with an independent government, Turks and Caicos have a somewhat unique position in the Caribbean. It's 35,000 inhabitants, enjoy a high standard of living with a GDP per capita of almost 24,000 US dollar, one of the highest in the Caribbean. But many countries in the region compete in similar sectors, tourism, real estate, financial services. What are the advantages that set Turks and Caicos apart from the other countries in the Caribbean? Immediately, being a British overseas territory, it brings some sort of political stability that is usually very attractive to investors. So we do have that political stability that we can market as a country. Our geographical location, easy access um, from many um, airports and our close proximity to the U.S., of course, is another plus. Um, the use of the U.S. dollar is also a, a strong plus for us. But I, I believe even so that we have a, a no tax regime or you know, no direct taxation and no corporate gains tax or direct taxation of any form makes us extremely competitive um, in bringing in investors and in you know, expanding an economy that we need to with a small population that we have. After four years leading the opposition as the head of the People's Democratic Movement, mm -hmm. you eventually took office in December 2016. What are your main goals for Turks and Caicos? Well, one of the first things is to really um, get our people back to work. Yes, we do have a high GDP, but um, at the end of the day, we're still you know, plaguing with a large number of unemployment, particularly among our youth. And I have um, run pretty, mu pretty much in all of the times that I've run on our youth platform. So it's important that we begin to engage them and get them back to work. Um, and whether it's entrepreneurs or employees, um, it's important that we train them and make sure that they are greater participants in the economy. Aside from that, of course, we have to responsibly then manage and grow our population. That is important for us. We are a country of, of, of migrants, um, and it's important that we manage the cultures that come. We continue to welcome them, but that we grow it responsibly in the way that we want to see our country um, develop. And of course, the, that will feed into um, how we we grow our economy, with whom we will grow it. Also for us is, is a matter of priority crime, as people can appreciate. We would want to make sure that that remains at low levels because we are heavily dependent on tourism. So national security is a major issue for us. We brag about having open borders and the chain of islands, but sometimes that's not the best thing. So we are plagued like the Bahama Islands and even Florida um, with persons from neighboring countries you know, permeating our borders illegally. So those are issues that we would want to have as a priority to make sure that we're managing um, immigration in our country. So we do have a number of priorities, um, and certainly education is important for us in positioning our people. You mentioned tourism. Tourism is the engine of the Turks and Caicos economy, as it generates more than half of GDP directly and indirectly. In 2015, you received over 1.3 million visitors, which clearly makes you a leader in this field. How do you plan to keep growing this sector? That was contributed to largely by our cruise port. So we certainly want to pay attention to the island of Grand Turk and make it you know, somewhere that cruisers want to come. But also to turn those cruisers, if only 1%, into land-based tourists that they will want to return for overnight tourism as well. So we do intend to have a stronger cruise policy. And of course, then we want to diversify our tourism product as well. It is so important to do that, to make us unique and you know, make sure that persons have the Turks and Caicos true heritage experience. So we do intend to position ourselves even stronger as a tourism leader. With a GDP of approximately 800 million US dollar, the economy of Turks and Caicos strongly relies on foreign investment. Mm -hmm. In a recent meeting with the Financial Industry Association, you stated that you want to open the country for new businesses. Uh, the Caribbean is a strong competitive region in the financial sector, with countries offering, for instance, citizenship by investment programs or aggressive tax reductions. What is your strategy to compete with the other Caribbean countries? Well, first of all, is to carve out a niche market that is unique to us. Um, we do have leaders in different sectors in the financial services industry that we appreciate, and they've, they've taken a, a far start ahead of us. Um, we will compete in those areas. Last year, we 
um, introduced trust legislation, which I believe is going to be a strong niche market for us. But on coming to your office in the last month, um, I've reinstated and, and currently making appointments to a working group that will take a full assessment of the financial services industry, look at where we can grow and look at those possible new niche markets. It is important for my government that we diversify our economy, appreciating the fragility of the tourism industry and the fact that sometimes more external factors um, can negatively uh, impact us than, than anything else that we can control. So we are committed to the financial services industry. We do appreciate the challenge um, with the, the label sometimes of, of being a tax haven. And we have been compliant with all of the international regulations and laws, and we continue to, to um, ensure that we stay in, in, you know, in good books, I would say, in the international arena. But there are markets out there, niche markets, niche products, that we can certainly venture into. And once that study and that assessment of the services, um, that financial services industry is completed, we will know exactly where we are and what we want to do. You mentioned risks that you cannot control. Actually, mm -hmm. Turks and Caicos was strongly hit eight years ago by the global financial crisis yes. and Hurricane Ike, a combination that lowered the tourism sector's mm -hmm. revenue and had a serious impact on the economy. However, according to the International Monetary Fund, the country's economy maintains a steady growth mm -hmm. and a public debt that has been dropped mm -hmm. to around 11% of GDP. To what do you attribute this economic performance? Well, um, th there's an upsurge, there's an upturn again in leading industries. Um, tourism is back up. Um, we, we benefited from extended winters um, in other countries, so we're grateful for that. <laughs> you know, and they, they, you know, persons look for a warm place to come when we are still new. We're still uncharted waters for many tourists, and we've done quite a bit through private sector partnership in terms of marketing the country. And then we've also had the, the benefit of having um, the real estate market now turn up as well. So that is, has contributed greatly again to our growing uh, market, our growing economy. But even prior to 2008 and the strategy for my government to protect us and buffer us against any external negative factors um, it was about 2000 and 9-11. You know, we had the benefit of having a reserve fund, a savings account pretty much um, for a government and my government intends to reintroduce something called a sovereign wealth fund um, which would be a buffer, so if anything happens negatively, that we'll be able to buffer um, from losses, of course, from taxes that we would have received through booming tourism industry or anything else. In 2009, the British government temporarily took over the economy of Turks and Caicos and overhauled the country's finances. On another note, your predecessor is currently facing trial for mismanagement of funds. We mentioned the country's economic performance that is going well. However, what are your priorities in order to restore uh, the island's reputation as a trustworthy actor? Well, we've bounced back. I believe that we, we've um, had a, a good, we're on a good path to restoring our, our country's reputation. Um, the mere fact that trials are happening, it shows persons that we're a country that believes no one is above the rule of law and that if there are allegations, of course, that they have their right and they have their day in court. But it is certainly a statement that we're not embarrassed of. The mere fact that um, court cases are going on, I think it's very positive for the Turks and Caicos. We have put in place very strong financial management legislation. We have a very strong constitution that provides even stronger oversight. So um, persons who come into Turks and Caicos will see that this is a very different Turks and Caicos. We're open for business and persons can feel that you know we have they can invest in the country with a positive and strong reputation and we've, we've done a great deal already in restoring ourselves. Their relation with the United States is crucial for Turks and Caicos. 60% of your imports come from the US as well as the large majority of tourists who are the main country source of revenue. The US-Caribbean Strategic Engagement Act of 2016 that strengthens the relation between the US and the Caribbean was signed just before President Obama left office. On the other hand, the new administration may implement protectionist policies. What do you expect for, from the future relations with the United States? We will always have a relationship um, with the United States. We must have a relationship with the United States. Aside from the majority of tourists that comes from North America, of course, all of our imports, about 90%, comes out of the United States. So, I mean, it's important that we, we work 
and whatever policies and laws that we have to strengthen that relationship because for the foreseeable future, um, we're going to continue to heavily rely on, on America. So on one hand, you're a Caribbean country. On the other hand, you're a British overseas territory. Which one of these factors is more important in, in your relation with the U.S.? Because we see that the British and the Americans, they have this special relationship. Well, I mean, they're equally important. Um, you have to remember the role that Britain plays as well as an overseas territory. Um, we do have certain privileges um, with our relationship with Britain. And of course, Britain and the U.S. Uh, have always enjoyed a, a strong and a good relationship. I don't see any reason why that would change now. But the United States is important for our economy, which is very different. We are, we're not um, a dependent on the UK to the point that we, we receive grant and aid. You know, we run our own ministerial government. We, we chart our own waters in terms of the economy. So whilst we will rely on America, for example, for imports um, or for tourism, um, Britain is there as a buffer as well for any contingent liabilities. So if we need to borrow money, for example, um, they are there as guarantors. So the relationship with both are equally important. And I, I, I am one who firmly believe that we benefit a great deal from having a UK relationship because of the political stability that it brings. So I, I see them equally as important. And you were the first women premier yes. in the country's history. Additionally, many other high responsibility positions are currently held by women, such as deputy governor or attorney general. It is obviously a landmark regarding gender equality. How would you describe your experience as a woman being premier? Well, first of all, <laughs> I did not campaign as a woman <laughs> running. Um, in fact, my slogan was, she was the best man for the job. Okay. You know, so we did not focus at all on my gender. We didn't make it a woman's issue. While women were excited um, that a woman had aspired to this, I had already served in so many political positions, um, being the first deputy leader, first party leader, first female leader of the opposition. Um, it was almost as if it was a natural <laughs> um, next step. So persons got to appreciate me as someone who gets the job done strong, not necessarily a woman. But I think the woman cap fits now because I believe that there is a higher standard now that is being required. Persons expect for you to be dainty, but they expect you to be strong. So there is that balance that you have to continue to achieve. If you're too aggressive, then there's something else they, they, they want to consider you as. You know, but I, I, I believe in the years that I've come up in the almost 20 years that I've just earned respect from persons. And, and whilst I celebrate being the first female um, premier, persons just see me as someone who can get the job done. Because you personally have a very successful career in politics. Yes. You were chair of several committees and you were, as you mentioned, the first woman leader in the opposition. Do you feel that sometimes too much attention is paid to your gender? instead of your political or professional achievements? Well, no, because I, I, I never focused on, and I never had persons focus on me being a woman. People focused on me getting the job done. So I came up the ranks in my party by getting the job done. They saw me as someone who was reliable. There's this focus now because there's history. You know, there's probably even more focus now because I'm the first female premier. There was less focus when I was the first female leader of the opposition. Um, and it's because it is celebrated around the world. I believe the Hillary Clinton factor has, has something to do with it, as well as I'm the first female that has been elected to um, this position in the overseas territories, the British overseas territories. Mm -hmm. So there is that focus because of the historical nature of it. But there hasn't been really a focus on my gender. And so it is with my colleagues. We have, for the first time, the first female chief justice. Um, she's just someone who sits strong on the bench. The Attorney General, she's just a very strong individual. You know, it wasn't a matter of trying to achieve a balance of gender equality. It was a matter of that person's work and have been recognized for their work and they've succeeded and in, in been placed in high offices. And after all this career, uh, what are you most proud of? My daughters. Oh, <laughs> I, I have two girls, a wonderful husband, and at the end of the day I go home to my sanctuary with my beautiful girls and my husband. You know, that's my greatest accomplishment in life, being a mother. They certainly keep me humble and keep me balanced, <laughs> you know, but um, my greatest joy is my family. My greatest accomplishment is my marriage and my children. As a conclusion to the interview, what would you like to say about the future of Turks and Caicos under your administration? Well, my, my government is certainly opening the doors of Turks and Caicos wider for business, and we're not just focusing on 
persons who are coming in, but persons who have at least always stayed with us and are prepared to ex expand their business. So you'll see policies that come forward that is preferable as well to, um, to persons who have been staying in Turks and Caicos and doing business. We're going to make business in Turks and Caicos easier um, doing business and make sure that the red carpet is indeed rolled out for persons who want to come to Turks and Caicos. It is an exciting time in Turks and Caicos. We are poised to just go up. You know, with everything turning up, the economy, um, different sectors of society um, are just anxious about the change. And there's a fresh and new enthusiasm that we hope that when persons come to Turks and Caicos, they'll just be captivated by it. And whether you come as a tourist or you come as an investor, we will be making sure that you understand that you're welcome to stay in the Turks and Caicos. Thank you very much, Premier Cartwright Robinson, for taking your time to meet us. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Turks and Caicos.